Hello and welcome. I'm Jennifer March, and this is not your mother's story time. This week, we are embarking on a journey through Winesburg, Ohio, a group of tales of Ohio small town life by Sherwood Anderson. I will read three or four stories each week. There are 22 stories in all, so this will be over several weeks. Each of the stories shares a specific character's past and present struggle to overcome the loneliness and isolation that seem to permeate the town. Stylistically, because of its emphasis on the psychological insights of characters over plot and plain spoken prose, Winesburg, Ohio is known as one of the earliest works of modernist literature. It is typically placed midway between the novel proper and the mere collection of stories known as the short story cycle. Aside from its structural unity, the common setting, characters, symbolism, and consistency of mood are all additional qualities that tie the stories together, despite their initial publication as separate tales. We'll start at the beginning. And now, Winesburg, Ohio, Chapter 1. The Book of the Grotesque. The writer, an old man with a white mustache, had some difficulty in getting into bed. The windows of the house in which he lived were high, and he wanted to look at the trees when he awoke in the morning. A carpenter came to fix the bed so that it would be on a level with the window. Quite a fuss was made about the matter. The carpenter, who had been a soldier in the Civil War, came into the writer's room and sat down to talk of building a platform for the purpose of raising the bed. The writer had cigars lying about, and the carpenter smoked. For a time, the two men talked of the raising of the bed, and then talked of other things. The soldier got on the subject of the war. The writer, in fact, led him to that subject. The carpenter had once been a prisoner in Andersonville Prison, and had lost a brother. The brother had died of starvation, and when the carpenter got upon that subject, he cried. He, like the old writer, had a white mustache, and when he cried, he puckered up his lips, and the mustache bobbed up and down. The weeping old man with the cigar in his mouth was ludicrous. The plan the writer had for the raising of the bed was forgotten, and later the carpenter did it his own way, and the writer, who was past sixty, had to help himself with a chair when he went to bed at night. In his bed, the writer rolled over on his side and lay quite still. For years he had been beset with notions concerning his heart. He was a hard smoker, and his heart fluttered. The idea had got into his mind that he would sometime die unexpectedly, and always when he got into bed he thought of that. It did not alarm him. The effect, in fact, was quite a special thing, and not easily explained. It made him more alive there in bed than at any other time. Perfectly still he lay, and his body was old and not of much use any more. But something inside him was altogether young. He was like a pregnant woman, only that the thing inside him was not a baby, but a youth. No, it wasn't a youth. It was a woman, young, and wearing a coat of mail like a knight. It is absurd, you see, to try to tell what was inside the old writer as he lay on his high bed and listened to the fluttering of his heart. The thing to get at is what the writer or the young thing within the writer was thinking about. The old writer, like all of the people in the world, had got during his long life a great many notions in his head. He had once been quite handsome, and a number of women had been in love with him. And then, of course, he had known people, many people, known them in a peculiarly intimate way that was different from the way in which you and I know people. At least, that is what the writer thought, and the thought pleased him. Why quarrel with an old man concerning his thoughts? In the bed, the writer had a dream that was not a dream. As he grew somewhat sleepy but was still conscious, figures began to appear before his eyes. He imagined the young, indescribable thing within himself was driving a long procession of figures before his eyes. 
You see, the interest in all this lies in the figures that went before the eyes of the writer. They were all grotesques. All of the men and women the writer had ever known had become grotesques. The grotesques were not all horrible. Some were amusing, some almost beautiful. And one, a woman, all drawn out of shape, hurt the old man by her grotesqueness. When she passed, he made a noise like a little dog whimpering. Had you come into the room, you might have supposed the old man had an unpleasant dream, or perhaps indigestion. For an hour the procession of grotesques passed before the eyes of the old man, and then, although it was a painful thing to do, he crept out of bed and began to write. Some of the grotesques had made a deep impression on his mind, and he wanted to describe it. At his desk, the writer worked for an hour. In the end, he wrote a book which he called The Book of the Grotesque. It was never published, but I saw it once, and it made an indelible impression on my mind. The book had one central thought that is very strange and has always remained with me. By remembering it, I have been able to understand many people and things that I was never able to understand before. The thought was involved, but a simple statement of it would be something like this. That in the beginning, when the world was young, there were a great many thoughts, but no such thing as a truth. Man made the truths himself, and each truth was a composite of a great many vague thoughts. All about in the world were the truths, and they were all beautiful. The old man had listed hundreds of the truths in his book. I will not try to tell you all of them. There was the truth of virginity, and the truth of passion, the truth of wealth and poverty, of thrift and of profligacy, of carelessness and abandon. Hundreds and hundreds were the truths, and they were all beautiful. And then the people came along. Each, as he appeared, snatched up one of the truths, and some who were quite strong snatched up a dozen of them. It was the truths that made the people grotesques. The old man had quite an elaborate theory concerning the matter. It was his notion that the moment one of the people took one of the truths to himself, called it his truth, and tried to live his life by it, he became a grotesque, and the truth he embraced became a falsehood. You can see for yourself how the old man, who had spent all of his life writing and was filled with words, would write hundreds of pages concerning this matter. The subject would become so big in his mind that he himself would be in danger of becoming a grotesque. He didn't, I suppose, for the same reason that he never published the book. It was the young thing inside him that saved the old man. Concerning the carpenter who fixed the bed for the writer, I only mentioned him because he, like many of what are called very common people, become the nearest thing to what is understandable and lovable of all the grotesques in the writer's book. Hands Concerning Wing Biddlebaum Upon the half-decayed veranda of a small frame house that stood near the edge of a ravine near the town of Winesburg, Ohio, a fat little man walked nervously up and down. Across a long field that had been seeded for clover, but that had produced only a dense crop of yellow mustard weeds, he could see the public highway along which went a wagon, filled with berry pickers returning from the fields. The berry pickers, youths and maidens, laughed and shouted boisterously, a boy, clad in a blue shirt, leaped from the wagon and attempted to drag after him one of the maidens, who screamed and protested shrilly. The feet of the boy in the road kicked up a cloud of dust that floated across the face of the departing sun. Over the long field came a thin, girlish voice. Oh, you wing biddlebaum, comb your hair, it's falling into your eyes, commanded the voice to the man, who was bald and whose nervous little hands fiddled about the bare white forehead as though arranging a mass of tangled locks. Wing Biddlebaum, forever frightened and beset by a ghostly band of doubts, 
did not think of himself as in any way a part of the life of the town where he had lived for twenty years. Among all the people of Winesburg, but one had come close to him. With George Willard, son of Tom Willard, the proprietor of the new Willard house, he had formed something like a friendship. George Willard was the reporter on the Winesburg Eagle, and sometimes in the evenings he walked out along the highway to Wing Biddlebaum's house. Now, as the old man walked up and down on the veranda, his hands moving nervously about, he was hoping that George Willard would come and spend the evening with him. After the wagon containing the berry pickers had passed, he went across the field through the tall mustard weeds and climbed a rail fence, peering anxiously along the road to the town. For a moment he stood thus, rubbing his hands together and looking up and down the road, and then, fear overcoming him, ran back to walk again upon the porch on his own house. In the presence of George Willard, Wing Biddlebaum, who for twenty years had been the town mystery, lost something of his timidity, and his shadowy personality, submerged in a sea of doubts, came forth to look at the world. With the young reporter at his side, he ventured into the light of day into Main Street, or strode up and down on the rickety front porch of his own house, talking excitedly. The voice that had been low and trembling became shrill and loud. The bent figure straightened. With a kind of wriggle, like a fish returned to the brook by the fisherman, Biddlebaum the Silent began to talk, striving to put into words the ideas that had been accumulated by his mind during long years of silence. Wing Biddlebaum talked much with his hands, the slender expressive fingers, forever active, forever striving to conceal themselves in his pockets or behind his back, came forth and became the piston rods of his machinery of expression. The story of Wing Biddlebaum is a story of hands. Their restless activity, like unto the beating of the wings of an imprisoned bird, had given him his name. Some obscure poet of the town had thought of it. The hands alarmed their owner. He wanted to keep them hidden away, and looked with amazement at the quiet, inexpressive hands of other men who worked beside him in the fields, or passed driving sleepy teams on country roads. When he talked to George Willard, Wing Biddlebaum closed his fists and beat with them upon a table or on the walls of his house. The action made him more comfortable. If the desire to talk came to him when the two were walking in the fields, he sought out a stump or the top board of a fence, and with his hands pounding busily, talked with renewed ease. The story of Wing Biddlebaum's hands is worth a book in itself. Sympathetically set forth, it would tap many strange, beautiful qualities in obscure men. It is a job for a poet. In Winesburg, the hands had attracted attention merely because of their activity. With them, Wing Biddlebaum had picked as high as a hundred and forty quarts of strawberries in a day. They became his distinguishing feature, the source of his fame. Also, they made more grotesque an already grotesque and elusive individual. Winesburg was proud of the hands of Wing Biddlebaum, in the same spirit in which it was proud of Banker White's new stone house, and Wellesley Moyer's bay stallion, Tony Tip, that had won the 215 trot at the fall races in Cleveland. As for George Willard, he had many times wanted to ask about the hands. At times an almost overwhelming curiosity had taken hold of him. He felt that there must be a reason for their strange activity and their inclination to keep hidden away, and only a growing respect for Wing Biddlebaum kept him from blurting out the questions that were often in his mind. Once he had been on the point of asking. The two were walking in the field on a summer afternoon and had stopped to sit upon a grassy bank. All afternoon, Wing Biddlebaum had talked as one inspired. By a fence he had stopped and, beating like a giant woodpecker upon the top board, had shouted at George Willard, condemning his tendency to be too much influenced by the people about him. You are destroying yourself, he cried. You have the inclination to be alone and to dream, and you are afraid of dreams. You want to be like others in town here. You hear them talk, and you try to imitate them. On the grassy bank, 
Wing Biddlebaum had tried again to drive his point home. His voice became soft and reminiscent, and with a sigh of contentment, he launched into a long, rambling talk, speaking as one in a lost dream. Out of the dream, Wing Biddlebaum made a picture for George Willard. In the picture, men lived again in a kind of pastoral golden age. Across a green open country came clean-limbed young men, some afoot, some mounted upon horses. In crowds, the young men came to gather about the feet of an old man who sat beneath a tree in a tiny garden and who talked to them. Wing Biddlebaum became wholly inspired. For once he forgot the hands. Slowly they stole forth and lay upon George Willard's shoulders. Something new and bold came into the voice that talked. You must try to forget all you have learned, said the old man. You must begin to dream. From this time on, you must shut your ears to the roaring of the voices. Pausing in his speech, Wing Biddlebaum looked long and earnestly at George Willard. His eyes glowed. Again he raised his hands to caress the boy, and then a look of horror swept over his face. With a convulsive movement of his body, Wing Biddlebaum sprang to his feet and thrust his hands deep into his trouser pockets. Tears came to his eyes. I must be getting along home. I can talk no more with you, he said nervously. Without looking back, The old man had hurried down the hillside and across a meadow, leaving George Willard perplexed and frightened upon the grassy slope. With a shiver of dread, the boy arose and went along the road toward town. I'll not ask him about his hands, he thought, touched by the memory of the terror he had seen in the man's eyes. There's something wrong, but I don't want to know what it is. His hands have something to do with his fear of me, and of everyone. And George Willard was right. Let us look briefly into the story of the hands. Perhaps our talking of them will arouse the poet who will tell the hidden wonder story of the influence for which the hands were but fluttering pennants of promise. In his youth, Wing Biddlebaum had been a schoolteacher in a town in Pennsylvania. He was not then known as Wing Biddlebaum, but went by the less euphonic name of Adolf Myers. As Adolf Myers, he was much loved by the boys of his school. Adolf Myers was meant by nature to be a teacher of youth. He was one of those rare, little-understood men who rule by a power so gentle that it passes as a lovable weakness. In their feeling for the boys under their charge, such men are not unlike the finer sort of women in their love of men, And yet, that is but crudely stated. It needs the poet there. With the boys of his school, Adolf Myers had walked in the evening or had sat talking until dusk upon the schoolhouse steps, lost in a kind of dream. Here and there went his hands, caressing the shoulders of the boys, playing about the tousled heads. As he talked, his voice became soft and musical. There was a caress in that also. In a way, the voice and the hands, the stroking of the shoulders and the touching of the hair, were part of the schoolmaster's effort to carry a dream into the young minds. By the caress that was in his fingers, he expressed himself. He was one of those men in whom the force that creates life is diffused, not centralized. Under the caress of his hands, doubt and disbelief went out of the minds of the boys, and they began also to dream. And then, the tragedy. A half-witted boy of the school became enamored of the young master. In his bed at night he imagined unspeakable things, and in the morning went forth to tell his dreams as facts. Strange, hideous accusations fell from his loose-hung lips. Through the Pennsylvania town went a shiver. Hidden, shadowy doubts that had been in men's minds concerning Adolf Myers were galvanized into beliefs. The tragedy did not linger. Trembling lads were jerked out of bed and questioned. He put his arms about me, said one. His fingers were always playing in my hair, said another. One afternoon, a man of the town, Henry Bradford, who kept a saloon, 
came to the schoolhouse door. Calling Adolf Myers into the schoolyard, he began to beat him with his fists. As his hard knuckles beat down into the frightened face of the schoolmaster, his wrath became more and more terrible. Screaming with dismay, the children ran here and there like disturbed insects. I'll teach you to put your hands on my boy, you beast, roared the saloon keeper, who, tired of beating the master, had begun to kick him about the yard. Adolf Myers was driven from the Pennsylvania town in the night. With lanterns in their hands, a dozen men came to the door of the house where he lived alone and commanded that he dress and come forth. It was raining, and one of the men had a rope in his hands. They had intended to hang the schoolmaster, but something in his figure, so small, white, and pitiful, touched their hearts, and they let him escape. As he ran away into the darkness, they repented of their weakness and ran after him, swearing and throwing sticks and great balls of soft mud at the figure that screamed and ran faster and faster into the darkness. For twenty years, Adolf Myers had lived alone in Winesburg. He was but forty, but looked sixty-five. The name of Biddlebaum he got from a box of goods seen at a freight station as he hurried through an eastern Ohio town. He had an aunt in Winesburg, a black-toothed old woman who raised chickens, and with her he lived until she died. He had been ill for a year after the experience in Pennsylvania, and after his recovery, worked as a day laborer in the fields, going timidly about and striving to conceal his hands. Although he did not understand what had happened, he felt that the hands must be to blame. Again and again the fathers of the boys had talked of the hands. Keep your hands to yourself, the saloon keeper had roared, dancing with fury in the schoolhouse yard. Upon the veranda of his house by the ravine, Wing Biddlebaum continued to walk up and down until the sun had disappeared and the road beyond the field was lost in the gray shadows. Going into his house, he cut slices of bread and spread honey upon them. When the rumble of the evening train that took away the express cars loaded with the day's harvest of berries had passed and restored the silence of the summer night, he went again to walk upon the veranda. In the darkness, he could not see the hands, and they became quiet. Although he still hungered for the presence of the boy, who was the medium through which he expressed his love of man, the hunger became again a part of his loneliness and his waiting. Lighting a lamp, Wing Biddlebaum washed the few dishes soiled by his simple meal and, setting up a folded cot by the screen door that led to the porch, prepared to undress for the night. A few stray white breadcrumbs lay on the cleanly washed floor by the table. Putting the lamp upon a low stool, he began to pick up the crumbs, carrying them to his mouth one by one with unbelievable rapidity. In the dense blotch of light beneath the table, the kneeling figure looked like a priest engaged in some service of his church. The nervous, expressive fingers, flashing in and out of the light, might well have been mistaken for the fingers of the devotee going swiftly through decade after decade of his rosary. Paper Pills Concerning Dr. Reefy he was an old man with a white beard and huge nose and hands. Long before the time during which we will know him, he was a doctor and drove a jaded white horse from house to house through the streets of Winesburg. Later, he married a girl who had money. She had been left a large fertile farm when her father died. The girl was quiet, tall and dark, and to many people she seemed very beautiful. Everyone in Winesburg wondered why she married the doctor. Within a year after the marriage, she died. The knuckles of the doctor's hands were extraordinarily large. When the hands were closed, they looked like clusters of unpainted wooden balls as large as walnuts fastened together by steel rods. He smoked a cob pipe, and after his wife's death, sat all day in his empty office, close by a window that was covered with cobwebs. He never opened the window, once on a hot day in August, he tried, but found it stuck fast, and after that, 
he forgot all about it. Weinsberg had forgotten the old man, but in Dr. Reefer there were the seeds of something very fine. Alone in his musty office in the Hefner block, above the Paris Dry Goods Company store, he worked ceaselessly, building up something that he himself destroyed. Little pyramids of truth, he erected, and after erecting, knocked them down again that he might have the truths to erect other pyramids. Dr. Reefy was a tall man who had worn one suit of clothes for ten years. It was frayed at the sleeves, and little holes had appeared at the knees and elbows. In the office, he wore also a linen duster with huge pockets into which he continually stuffed scraps of paper. After some weeks, the scraps of paper became little hard round balls, and when the pockets were filled, he dumped them out upon the floor. For ten years he had but one friend, another old man named John Spaniard, who owned a tree nursery. Sometimes, in a playful mood, old Dr. Reefer took from his pockets a handful of paper balls and threw them at the nurseryman. "'That is to confound you, you blathering old sentimentalist!' he cried, shaking with laughter. The story of Dr. Reefy and his courtship of the tall, dark girl who became his wife and left her money to him is a very curious story. It is delicious, like the twisted little apples that grow in the orchards of Weinsberg. In the fall, one walks in the orchards, and the ground is hard with frost underfoot. The apples have been taken from the trees by the pickers. They have been put in barrels and shipped to the cities where they will be eaten in apartments that are filled with books, magazines, furniture, and people. On the trees are only a few gnarled apples that the pickers have rejected. They look like the knuckles of Dr. Reefy's hands. One nibbles at them, and they are delicious. Into a little round place in the side of the apple has been gathered all the sweetness. One runs from tree to tree over the frosted ground, picking the gnarled, twisted apples and filling his pockets with them. Only the few know the sweetness of the twisted apples. The girl and Dr. Reefy began their courtship on a summer afternoon. He was forty-five then, and already he had begun the practice of filling his pockets with the scraps of paper that became hard balls and were thrown away. The habit had been formed as he sat in his buggy behind the jaded white horse and went slowly along country roads. On the papers were written thoughts, ends of thoughts, beginnings of thoughts. One by one, the mind of Dr. Reefy had made the thoughts. Out of many of them, he formed a truth that arose gigantic in his mind. The truth clouded the world. It became terrible and then faded away, and the little thoughts began again. The tall, dark girl came to see Dr. Reefy because she was in the family way and had become frightened. She was in that condition because of a series of circumstances also curious. The death of her father and mother and the rich acres of land that had come down to her had set a train of suitors on her heels. For two years she saw suitors almost every evening. Except two, they were all alike. They talked to her of passion, and there was a strained, eager quality in their voices and in their eyes when they looked at her. The two who were different were much unlike each other. One of them, a slender young man with white hands, the son of a jeweler in Weinsberg, talked continually of virginity. When he was with her, he was never off the subject. The other, a black-haired boy with large ears, said nothing at all, but always managed to get her into the darkness, where he began to kiss her. For a time, the dark girl thought she would marry the jeweler's son. For hours she sat in silence, listening as he talked to her, and then she began to be afraid of something. Beneath his talk of virginity, she began to think there was a lust greater than in all the others. At times it seemed to her that as he talked, he was holding her body in his hands. She imagined him turning it slowly about in the white hands and staring at it. At night, she dreamed that he had bitten into her body and that his jaws were dripping. She had the dream three times. Then she became in the family way to the one who said nothing at all 
but who in the moment of his passion actually did bite her shoulder, so that for days the marks of his teeth showed. After the tall, dark girl came to know Dr. Reefy, it seemed to her that she never wanted to leave him again. She went into his office one morning, and without her saying anything, he seemed to know what had happened to her. In the office of the doctor there was a woman, the wife of the man who kept the bookstore in Winesburg. Like all old-fashioned country practitioners, Dr. Reefy pulled teeth, and the woman who waited held a handkerchief to her teeth and groaned. Her husband was with her, and when the tooth was taken out, they both screamed, and blood ran down on the woman's white dress. The tall, dark girl did not pay any attention. When the woman and the man had gone, the doctor smiled. I will take you driving into the country with me, he said. For several weeks, the tall, dark girl and the doctor were together almost every day. The condition that had brought her to him passed in an illness, but she was like one who had discovered the sweetness of the twisted apples. She could not get her mind fixed again upon the round, perfect fruit that is eaten in the city apartments. In the fall, after the beginning of her acquaintanceship with him, she married Dr. Reefy, and in the following spring, she died. During the winter, he read to her all of the odds and ends of thoughts he had scribbled on the bits of paper. And after he read them, he laughed and stuffed them away in his pockets to become round, hard balls. Mother Concerning Elizabeth Willard Elizabeth Willard, the mother of George Willard, was tall and gaunt, and her face was marked with smallpox scars. Although she was but forty-five, some obscure disease had taken the fire out of her figure. Listlessly, she went about the disorderly old hotel, looking at the faded wallpaper and the ragged carpets, and when she was able to be about, doing the work of a chambermaid among beds soiled by the slumbers of fat traveling men. Her husband, Tom Willard, a slender, graceful man with square shoulders, a quick military step, and a black mustache trained to turn sharply up at the ends, tried to put the wife out of his mind. The presence of the tall, ghostly figure moving slowly through the halls he took as a reproach to himself. When he thought of her, he grew angry and swore. The hotel was unprofitable and forever on the edge of failure, and he wished himself out of it. He thought of the old house and the woman who lived there with him as things defeated and done for. The hotel in which he had begun life so hopefully was now a mere ghost of what a hotel should be. As he went spruce and businesslike through the streets of Winesburg, he sometimes stopped and turned quickly about, as though fearing that the spirit of the hotel and of the woman would follow him, even into the streets. Damn such a life! Damn it! he sputtered aimlessly. Tom Willard had a passion for village politics, and for years had been the leading Democrat in a strong Republican community. Some day, he told himself, the tide of things political will turn in my favor, and the years of ineffectual service count big in the bestowal of rewards. He dreamed of going to Congress, and even of becoming governor. Once, when a young member of the party arose at a political conference and began to boast of his faithful service, Tom Willard grew white with fury. Shut up, you, he roared, glaring about. What do you know of service? What are you but a boy? Look at what I've done here. I was a Democrat here in Winesburg when it was a crime to be a Democrat. In the old days, they fairly hunted us with guns. Between Elizabeth and her one son, George, there was a deep, unexpressed bond of sympathy, based on a girlhood dream that had long ago died. In the son's presence, she was timid and reserved, but sometimes, while he hurried about town intent upon his duties as a reporter, she went into his room, and closing the door knelt by a little desk, made of a kitchen table, that sat near a window. In the room by the desk she went through a ceremony that was half a prayer, half a demand, addressed to the skies. In the boyish figure she yearned to see something half forgotten that had once been a part of herself recreated. The prayer concerned that. 
Even though I die, I will in some way keep defeat from you, she cried, and so deep was her determination that her whole body shook. Her eyes glowed and she clenched her fists. If I am dead and see him becoming a meaningless drab figure like myself, I will come back, she declared. I ask God now to give me that privilege. I demand it. I will pay for it. God may beat me with his fists. I will take any blow that may befall if this my boy be allowed to express something for both of us. Pausing uncertainly, the woman stared about the boy's room. And do not let him become smart and successful either, she added vaguely. The communion between George Willard and his mother was outwardly a formal thing without meaning. When she was ill and sat by the window in her room, he sometimes went in the evening to make her a visit. They sat by a window that looked over the roof of a small frame building into Main Street. By turning their heads, they could see through another window, along an alleyway that ran behind the Main Street stores and into the back door of Abner Groff's bakery. Sometimes, as they sat thus, a picture of village life presented itself to them. At the back door of his shop appeared Abner Groff, with a stick or an empty milk bottle in his hand. For a long time there was a feud between the baker and a gray cat that belonged to Sylvester West, the druggist. The boy and his mother saw the cat creep into the door of the bakery, and presently emerge, followed by the baker, who swore and waved his arms about. The baker's eyes were small and red, and his black hair and beard were filled with flower dust. Sometimes he was so angry that although the cat had disappeared, he hurled sticks, bits of broken glass, and even some of the tools of his trade about. Once he broke a window at the back of Sinning's hardware store. In the alley the gray cat crouched behind barrels filled with torn paper and broken bottles, above which flew a black swarm of flies. Once, when she was alone and after watching a prolonged and ineffectual burst on the part of the baker, Elizabeth Willard put her head down on her long white hands and wept. After that, she did not look along the alleyway any more, but tried to forget the contest between the bearded man and the cat. It seemed like a rehearsal of her own life, terrible in its vividness. In the evening, when the son sat in the room with his mother, the silence made them both feel awkward. Darkness came on, and the evening train came in at the station. In the street below, feet tramped up and down upon a board sidewalk. In the station yard, after the evening train had gone, there was a heavy silence. Perhaps Skinner Leeson, the express agent, moved a truck the length of the station platform. Over on Main Street sounded a man's voice, laughing. The door of the express office banged. George Willard arose and, crossing the room, fumbled for the doorknob. Sometimes he knocked against a chair, making it scrape along the floor. By the window sat the sick woman, perfectly still, listless. Her long hands, white and bloodless, could be seen drooping over the ends of the arms of the chair. I think you had better be out among the boys. You are too much indoors, she said, striving to relieve the embarrassment of the departure. I thought I would take a walk, replied George Willard, who felt awkward and confused. One evening in July, when the transient guests who had made the new Willard house their temporary home had become scarce, and the hallways, lighted only by kerosene lamps turned low, were plunged in gloom, Elizabeth Willard, had an adventure. She had been ill in bed for several days, and her son had not come to visit her. She was alarmed. The feeble blaze of life that remained in her body was blown into a flame by her anxiety, and she crept out of bed, dressed, and hurried along the hallway toward her son's room, shaking with exaggerated fears. As she went along, she steadied herself with her hand, slipped along the papered walls of the hall, and breathed with difficulty. The air whistled through her teeth. As she hurried forward, she thought how foolish she was. He is concerned with boyish affairs, she told herself. 
Perhaps he has now begun to walk about in the evening with girls. Elizabeth Willard had a dread of being seen by guests in the hotel that had once belonged to her father, and the ownership of which still stood recorded in her name in the county courthouse. The hotel was continually losing patronage because of its shabbiness, and she thought of herself as also shabby. Her own room was in an obscure corner, and when she felt able to work, she voluntarily worked among the beds, preferring the labor that could be done when the guests were abroad, seeking trade among the merchants of Winesburg. By the door of her son's room, the mother knelt upon the floor and listened for sounds from within. When she heard the boy moving about and talking in low tones, a smile came to her lips. George Willard had a habit of talking aloud to himself, and to hear him doing so had always given his mother a peculiar pleasure. The habit in him, she felt, strengthened the secret bond that existed between them. A thousand times she had whispered to herself of the matter. He is groping about, trying to find himself, she thought. He is not a dull clod, all words and smartness. Within him there is a secret something that is striving to grow. It is the thing I let be killed in myself. In the darkness, in the hallway by the door, the sick woman arose and started again toward her room. She was afraid that the door would open and the boy come upon her. When she had reached a safe distance and was about to turn a corner into the second hallway, she stopped and, bracing herself with her hands, waited, thinking to shake off a trembling fit of weakness that had come upon her. The presence of the boy in the room had made her happy. In her bed, during the long hours alone, the little fears that had visited her had become giants. Now they were all gone. When I get back to my room, I shall sleep, she murmured gratefully. But Elizabeth Willard was not to return to her bed and to sleep. As she stood trembling in the darkness, the door of her son's room opened, and the boy's father, Tom Willard, stepped out. In the light that streamed out at the door, he stood with a knob in his hand and talked. What he said infuriated the woman. Tom Willard was ambitious for his son. He had always thought of himself as a successful man, although nothing he had ever done had turned out successfully. However, when he was out of sight of the new Willard house and had no fear of coming upon his wife, he swaggered and began to dramatize himself as one of the chief men of the town. He wanted his son to succeed. He it was who had secured for the boy the position on the Winesburg Eagle. Now, with a ring of earnestness in his voice, he was advising concerning some course of conduct. I tell you what, George, you've got to wake up, he said sharply. Will Henderson has spoken to me three times concerning the matter. He says you go along for hours not hearing when you're spoken to and acting like a gawky girl. What ails you? Tom Willard laughed good-naturedly. Well, I guess you'll get over it, he said. I told Will that. You're not a fool, and you're not a woman. You're Tom Willard's son, and you'll wake up. I'm not afraid. What you say clears things up. If being a newspaper man had put the notion of becoming a writer into your mind, that's all right. Only I guess you'll have to wake up to do that too, eh? Tom Willard went briskly along the hallway and down a flight of stairs to the office. The woman in the darkness could hear him laughing and talking with a guest who was striving to wear away a dull evening by dozing in a chair by the office door. She returned to the door of her son's room. The weakness had passed from her body, as by a miracle, and she stepped boldly along. A thousand ideas raced through her head. When she heard the scraping of a chair and the sound of a pen scratching upon paper, she again turned and went back along the hallway to her own room. A definite determination had come into the mind of the defeated wife of the Winesburg hotel keeper. The determination was the result of long years of quiet and rather ineffectual thinking. Now, she told herself, I will act. There is something threatening my boy, and I will ward it off. The fact that the conversation between Tom Willard and his son had been rather quiet and natural as though an understanding existed between them, 
maddened her. Although for years she had hated her husband, her hatred had always before been a quite impersonal thing. He had been merely a part of something else that she hated. Now, and by the few words at the door, he had become the thing personified. In the darkness of her own room, she clenched her fists and glared about. Going to a cloth bag that hung on a nail by the wall, she took out a long pair of sewing scissors and held them in her hand like a dagger. I will stab him, she said aloud. He has chosen to be the voice of evil, and I will kill him. When I have killed him, something will snap within myself, and I will die also. It will be a release for all of us. In her girlhood, and before her marriage with Tom Willard, Elizabeth had borne a somewhat shaky reputation in Winesburg. For years she had been what is called stage-struck, and had paraded through the streets with traveling men, guests at her father's hotel, wearing loud clothes and urging them to tell her of life in the cities out of which they had come. Once she startled the town by putting on men's clothes and riding a bicycle down Main Street. In her own mind, the tall, dark girl had been in those days much confused. A great restlessness was in her, and it expressed itself in two ways. First, there was an uneasy desire for change, for some big definite movement to her life. It was this feeling that had turned her mind to the stage. She dreamed of joining some company and wandering over the world, seeing always new faces and giving something out of herself to all people. Sometimes at night, she was quite beside herself with the thought, but when she tried to talk of the matter to the members of the theatrical companies that came to Winesburg and stopped at her father's hotel, she got nowhere. They did not seem to know what she meant, or if she did get something of her passion expressed. They only laughed. It's not like that, they said. It's all dull and uninteresting as this here. Nothing comes of it. With the traveling men when she walked about with them, and later with Tom Willard, it was quite different. Always they seemed to understand and sympathize with her. On the side streets of the village, in the darkness under the trees, they took hold of her hand, and she thought that something unexpressed in herself came forth and became a part of an unexpressed something in them. And then there was the second expression of a restlessness. When that came, she felt for a time released and happy. She did not blame the men who walked with her, and later she did not blame Tom Willard. It was always the same, beginning with kisses, and ending, after strange, wild emotions, with peace and then sobbing repentance. When she sobbed, she put her hand upon the face of the man, and had always the same thought. Even though he were large and bearded, she thought he had become suddenly a little boy. She wondered why he did not sob also. In her room, tucked away in a corner of the old Willard house, Elizabeth Willard lighted a lamp and put it on a dressing table that stood by the door. A thought had come into her mind, and she went to a closet and brought out a small square box and set it on the table. The box contained material for makeup and had been left with other things by a theatrical company that had once been stranded in Winesburg. Elizabeth Willard had decided that she would be beautiful. Her hair was still black, and there was a great mass of it braided and coiled about her head. The scene that was to take place in the office below began to grow in her mind. No ghostly worn-out figure should confront Tom Willard, but something quite unexpected and startling. Tall, with dusky cheeks and hair that fell in a mass from her shoulders, a figure should come striding down the stairway before the startled loungers in the hotel office. The figure would be silent. It would be swift and terrible. A tigress whose cub had been threatened would she appear, coming out of the shadows, stealing noiselessly along and holding the long, wicked scissors in her hand. With a little broken sob in her throat, Elizabeth Willard blew out the light that stood upon the table and stood weak and trembling in the darkness. The strength that had been as a miracle in her body left and she half reeled across the floor, clutching at the back of the chair in which she had spent so many long days, staring out over the tin roofs into the main street of Winesburg. In the hallway, 
there was the sound of footsteps, and George Willard came in at the door. Sitting in a chair beside his mother, he began to talk. I'm going to get out of here, he said. I don't know where I shall go or what I shall do, but I'm going away. The woman in the chair waited and trembled. An impulse came to her. I suppose you had better wake up, she said. You think that? You will go to the city and make money, eh? It will be better for you, you think, to be a businessman, to be brisk and smart and alive. She waited and trembled. The son shook his head. I suppose I can't make you understand, but oh, how I wish I could, he said earnestly. I can't even talk to father about it. I don't try. There isn't any use. I don't know what I shall do. I just want to go away and look at people and think. Silence fell upon the room where the boy and woman sat together. Again, as on the other evenings, they were embarrassed. After a time, the boy tried again to talk. I suppose it won't be for a year or two, but I've been thinking about it, he said, rising and going toward the door. Something father said makes it sure that I shall have to go away. He fumbled with the doorknob. In the room, the silence became unbearable to the woman. She wanted to cry out with joy because of the words that had come from the lips of her son. But the expression of joy had become impossible to her. I think you had better go out among the boys. You are too much indoors, she said. I thought I would go for a little walk, replied the son, stepping awkwardly out of the room and closing the door. And those are our stories for this evening. I hope you enjoyed The Book of the Grotesque, Hands, Paper Pills, and Mother, from Winesburg, Ohio, A Group of Tales of Ohio Small Town Life, by Sherwood Anderson. Thank you for listening. I'm Jennifer March, and this is not your mother's story time.